Good evening. I'm Josh Rubner, Managing Director of American Muslims for Palestine. Welcome to AMP's 13th Annual Convention for Palestine. I'll be moderating our first panel tonight, the Palestine Agenda and the 2020 Elections. In the aftermath of this year's tumultuous presidential and congressional elections, what are the opportunities that exist in the US political system to advocate for and advance Palestinian rights? And how can we best push the next administration and the new Congress to support Palestinian self-determination? Before I introduce our all-star lineup of experts to address these questions, let's begin the session with a video from Representative Betty McCollum, Congresswoman from Minnesota's 4th Congressional District. Greetings to everyone participating in AMP's National Conference. I'm Congresswoman Betty McCollum, and I want to wish you all a happy Thanksgiving and good health during this difficult time of COVID. Working to protect human rights has always been a priority for me in Congress, and nowhere is the fight to protect human rights and to promote human dignity more urgent than in Palestine. Palestinian people absolutely deserve peace, security, human rights, and the rights to self-determination. They also deserve a future filled with hope, opportunity, and prosperity. Instead, Palestinians are forced to survive under Israeli occupation, living under brutal conditions, constant threat of abuse, violence, and annexation. Thank all of you from all across the country for supporting the two bills I've introduced in the U.S. House to promote Palestinian rights, H.R. 2407 and H.R. 8050. These bills are important vehicles to organize and mobilize Americans to support Palestinian rights. They're also intended to send a clear message to my colleagues, to the American people, and to the Palestinian people that in Congress where Palestinian rights are ignored, I want the world to know that there are American political leaders who respect the rights and dignity of Palestinian people. And I am proud to stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people. And I was very honored to receive AMP's Champion of Palestinian Rights Award earlier this year. Your support means the world to me. Thank you and have a great conference. Congresswoman McCollum sends her regrets that she wasn't able to join us live tonight, but we sincerely thank her for her statement and for her pathbreaking efforts in Congress to advocate for Palestinian rights. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists in alphabetical order by their last names. After that, each panelist will share some brief introductory remarks in the order they were introduced. Phyllis Bennis is the program director of the New Internationalism Project at the Institute for Policy Studies, focusing on Middle East, U.S. wars, and U.N. issues. In 2001, she helped found the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights and now serves on the National Board of Jewish Voice for Peace. Phyllis has written and edited 11 books. Among her latest is the just published seventh updated edition of her popular Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict. Khaled Al-Gindi is a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute and directs its program on Palestine and Israeli-Palestinian affairs. He's the author of the newly released book, Blind Spot, America and the Palestinians from Balfour to Trump. Khaled previously served as a fellow in the foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution and, and as an advisor to the Palestinian leadership in Ramallah on permanent status negotiations with Israel. Zaha Hassan is a visiting fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She focuses on Palestine-Israel peace the use of international legal mechanisms by political movements and US foreign policy in the region. Previously, she was the senior legal advisor to the Palestinian negotiating team during Palestine's bid for UN membership. Zaha's commentary appears in The Hill, Haaretz, New York Times, Salon, Al Jazeera, CNN, and others. Thank you all so much for being here with us tonight. Phyllis, the floor is yours. Thanks, Josh, and thanks to everybody at AMP. It's great that you're here to talk about Palestinian rights, to figure out strategies for mobilizing for Palestinian rights, 
it's such a crucial moment. It's such a crucial time. And the urgency, as Representative McCollum said, is so great. We're going to have time in our discussion to talk about strategies and what we can do in Congress and with the new administration. But I wanted to just flag a, a, a new issue that just emerged in the last few hours. Some of you have probably already heard that there was an assassination today in Iran, outside of Tehran, the assassination of Professor Fakhrizadeh, uh, who is a longtime professor of, of physics and is thought to have been one of the leaders of Iran's nuclear power project for many, many years. He was assassinated suddenly after long-standing threats against him. And the dangers of this, aside from the, the violation of uh, all kinds of international and domestic laws that were involved, of course, uh, is the, the political consequences are, are potentially quite severe for Palestinian rights. It shows us how much Palestine has been pushed off the agenda during the four years of the Trump administration in particular, so that it's no longer a central question. Palestinian rights are not a question. And in fact, Israel-Palestine and the conflict, as they like to call it, is also not a central issue for the US, for Israel, for the Gulf monarchies, for the other Arab dictatorships. None of them are very interested right now in dealing with Palestinian rights. So it falls back to not only the Palestinians themselves, but to global civil society, to, the U to pressure the UN, to pressure other member states. But we have to look at this as a very dangerous indicator of how the, the shifting of the balance of forces in the region has changed away from Palestine to the question of what's the regional mobilization against Iran going to look like? That was the goal of four years of the Trump administration, to mobilize an anti-Iran coalition led by Israel and Saudi Arabia, with the UAE and other countries participating as well. And the question now is, what's the Biden administration coming in going to do about that? Because we know, and we'll again, we'll talk about this later, but just quickly, we know that it's much more difficult. It requires a lot more political capital to reverse an existing policy than it does to refuse to implement a bad policy. So the Biden administration is coming in not only with all the bad policies of uncritical US military and economic and, and political aid to Israel that has gone on for, for decades now, but also with the kind of extremism that we've seen over the last four years of Trump. So the recognition of Jerusalem as the so-called capital of Israel, moving the US embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, acknowledging the Golan Heights as supposedly under Israeli sovereignty, supporting annexation, acknowledging and supporting the legitimacy of Israel's nation state law. All of these things, many of which the incoming president has said in the past he disagrees with, he wouldn't have done that, but he's not prepared necessarily to reverse that. So our challenge tonight is to talk about all of the options in a much more difficult situation right now than we've faced before. So I'll leave it to my colleagues to open up and then we'll have a good discussion, I hope. Thank you. Thanks, Phyllis. Go ahead, Khaled. Thanks. Um, sorry. Um, uh, thanks, Josh, and uh, uh, thank you all for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with the AMP uh, and their conference this uh, this year. Um, so let me just make a couple opening uh, points, and uh, I look forward to uh, a more uh, in-depth discussion with my fellow panelists. First, uh, I thought um, we'll take a quick look at what Biden has said he wouldn't wouldn't do. As, as uh, Phyllis alluded to, he has, uh, the Biden team has already indicated that they would reverse many, if not most of the Trump policies, uh, particularly those that were most directly damaging to, uh, to the goal of a two-state solution, which the Biden administration uh, is very much committed to. Um, so we're going to see a restoration of aid, uh, both to the Palestinian Authority, uh, as well as to uh, UNRWA, the United Nations uh, agency that takes care of Palestinian refugees. Um, the Biden team has also said that they would reopen the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem, that 
has primarily historically served as a uh, as the mission to uh, to the Palestinian people, um, as well as try to reopen the PLO embassy that the Trump administration closed down uh, in in 2018. Um, uh, of course, a lot of these measures will depend on uh, or will be somewhat limited by U.S. law. Things like uh, opening or reopening the PLO mission um, will have to overcome existing laws uh, that um, uh, impose sanctions on the on the Palestinians. Something that I, I'm sure uh, Zaha can speak to more uh, in greater detail than I. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but I, I think I would agree with uh, with Phyllis's point that it's probably not enough simply to go back to the status quo ante, um, particularly given the, the enormous damage that the Trump administration has done in terms of doing away with international norms, whether it's Resolution 242 or uh, basic international humanitarian law. Uh, the Trump administration went out of its way to... Uh, to negate those uh, those basic international norms, and and I think the incoming administration will not only have to take us back to where things were before Trump, but will have to do so as forcefully and as explicitly uh, uh, as the Trump administration has tried to undo them. Uh, so things like uh, the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by force a reaffirmation of basic international norms, the, the, the basic uh, rules of the political game, uh, I think have to be stated quite clearly, in, including the fundamental illegality of Israeli settlements. Um, <clears throat> that said, I think it very much matters how the Palestinian leadership, uh, such as it is, uh, responds. Uh, so, for, so far, what we've seen from the Palestinian leadership uh, is, uh, as, as most uh, probably are aware, in the immediate aftermath of the normalization agreements and in response to the possibility of Israeli annexation, the Palestinian leadership took two important steps. The first was to uh, uh, cut off uh, security and other forms of cooperation with the Israelis. Uh, and the second uh, was to move toward reconciliation uh, with Hamas uh, that included a call for new Palestinian elections, both in the occupied territories and presumably also in the diaspora for, uh, for a new uh, a Palestine National Council. Um, both of those uh, have essentially been reversed. The reconciliation track wasn't really going anywhere uh, and most recently, we saw the Palestinian Authority reverse its decision on uh, security cooperation, resuming that coordination uh, with Israelis. Both of those decisions, I think, have been quite unpopular. Um, what this suggests, uh, really, is that the Palestinian leadership is very much going back to the old school of putting all of its political eggs in the American basket. Uh, there is a, these were seen as uh, gestures uh, to the incoming administration as a sign of goodwill, and they, of course, were embraced by the uh, by the Biden team and and much of the Washington um, uh, establishment. Um, but it also, I think, suggests the absence of a of a real strategy. I think it's very hard to imagine um, any progress being made toward a resolution of the Palestinian problem without a, a new, clear Palestinian vision going forward that includes all segments of Palestinian, uh, of the Palestinian community, both inside and outside uh, of historic Palestine. Uh, and to me, I, I see that as, a, as the number one priority for uh, the Palestinian national movement. Go ahead, Zaha. Uh, 
Sorry, thank you. Um, thanks, Josh. And thanks to the organizers of the conference and to the uh, American Muslims for Palestine for all the work that you do towards getting us to a US foreign policy that centers human rights of Palestinians. I'm very honored to be among um, the others on this panel who I've known for many years and who I count among my friends. I'm also thrilled to follow the address of Representative Betty McCollum, who has done so much to humanize Palestinians in Congress and more broadly among Americans. I thought what I would talk about today, and I'm glad I came after Phyllis, uh, was what a, a Biden administration foreign policy approach will be like to the Middle East as a region, and how does Palestine Israel fit into that um, approach? You know, Biden's top line agenda items for the Middle East are three. First, he's going to want to lighten the US footprint in the region and empower US allies to do more to fill the US void. This means supporting this, you know, security assistance needs and other requirements of countries like Israel, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Egypt. Second, the U.S. will want to go back to the Iran Agreement, the JCPOA, and expand it to deal with other issues of concern, including Iran's support of proxies in the region. Third, a Biden administration will want to reimagine multilateralism and work with allies to prioritize respect for human rights and democracy and a values-based approach to foreign policy. What are the ramifications of these three agenda items for Palestine? Well, empowering um, allies like Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, and also Egypt, has generally resulted in greater security assistance to a region that's saturated in US weapons. Um, and these countries are generally countries that are engaged in conflicts where they've been guilty of gross human rights abuses. Um, so empowering these US allies is not gonna be good for Palestinian human rights and it's not gonna be good for human rights of others in the region. De-escalation with Iran and renegotiating the JCPOA will put the Biden administration in a posture of having to give something to Israel to placate it since Israel has been so central to the drive behind the US uh, withdrawal from the JCPOA. The thing that the Biden administration has to give is its positions on Israel-Palestine. So though Biden may oppose settlement expansion, for example, he's unlikely to come out of the gate reaffirming the Carter administration's legal opinion finding Israeli settlement construction illegal. In general, Biden is not going to want to pick a fight uh, with Israel, but that is not enough. Israel will want something more than that. It will want Biden's support for more normalization deals with Arab countries, and it will want Biden not to reverse actions that Trump took to obliterate the lines between the occupied West Bank and Israel. For example, the ways in which the U.S. has extended uh, bilateral cooperation agreements between Israel and the U.S. to the West Bank and the labeling of goods um, from Area C in the West Bank as made in Israel. Those are two things that Israel's not going to want to see a uh, Biden administration reverse. And I think um, it's going to use its leverage around um, U.S. engagement on, on the JCPOA to, to, um, to keep those things um, as, um, as the Biden administration is going to find them on day one. Now, with respect to reimagining multilateralism, we need to recall what the U.S. role has been in international fora when it comes to Israel. Well before the Trump administration, the U.S. posture has been to use its lone superpower status to provide diplomatic cover for Israel in the U.N. and in other multilateral mechanisms. The U.S. has defunded UNESCO for admitting Palestine as a member, voted consistently with Israel uh, and against most of the world, on resolutions to uphold international law and Palestinian human rights. And it has aggressively pursued the Human Rights Council for continuing to maintain Palestine as an agenda item. How will the Biden administration reimagine multilateralism as it relates to Israel-Palestine? We know from his foreign policy advisors that he intends to rejoin UN mechanisms precisely because of the need to stand with Israel in those bodies. So this will be a point of tension for the incoming administration, particularly given its promise to prioritize human rights. In what ways will a Biden administration impact Israeli human rights violations if it's also um, not uh, interested in conditioning U.S. assistance? What appetite will Biden have at all on Palestine-Israel given his prioritization of Iran? So these are some of the challenges for uh, a Biden foreign policy as it relates to Israel-Palestine. But I also think they could represent opportunities for organizing and, and we can discuss those later. Thanks.
Thank you, Zaha. Thank you to all of our panelists for these really salient framing remarks. Uh, Zaha, let me stay with you. After the Trump administration released its so-called deal of the century back in January, you wrote an article in the 972 magazine. And you talked about how Trump alone is not to blame for the U.S. disregard of Palestinian rights that we saw encapsulated in the deal of the century, that former Democratic administrations like the Clinton administration, like the Obama administration, deserve part of the blame as well. And you alluded to that in your, your opening remarks. But in this article, you talked about the parameters that they proposed to try to resolve the um, quote unquote Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So can you talk a little bit more about you know, what you meant by those administrations bearing some of the responsibility for the parameters they set out? Sure. You know, one of the sort of underlying um, assumptions of successive U.S. administrations has been that there it's legitimate for Israel to maintain a decisive Jewish majority state. And so over the years, there have been uh, concessions asked of Palestinians in order to allow Israel to maintain this decisive uh, Jewish majority. So, for example, on the refugee issue. Um, almost immediately when negotiations started and U.S. Um, took over as facilitator of those ne negotiations, Palestinians were asked to, you know, manage their expectations about refugee return. And Clinton in introduced parameters around Jerusalem, which basically said that what's currently Arab should stay Arab and what's Jewish should stay Jewish. So meaning for, you know, Palestinians, meaning that Jewish settlement inside of the of east jerusalem should stay with israel and um accommodating israel's um, interest in maintaining maintaining decisive demographic majority in the city uh, of jerusalem um similarly you go into uh, uh, a bush administration bush two and president bush again trying to accommodate the large settlement blocks that israel had expanded um inside the west bank telling Ariel Sharon in a letter committing uh, the U.S. to a position that it's it's going to, you know, look favorably upon, um, you know, including those settlement blocks within the state of Israel. So thereby telling Palestinians that they would have to concede on the large settlement blocks. And we get to uh, President Obama's uh, administration, and we have a, an administration that, uh, was the first one to adopt the idea that Palestinians had to recognize Israel as a Jewish state and as a uh, as the nation state of the uh, or a national homeland of, of the Jewish people. This was really, um, you know, problematic for three re three reasons. First, because it effectively told uh, the Palestinian citizens of Israel that they, um, you know it left them in a precarious position because if Israel's the Jewish state, what, what does that mean for them as citizens of that state? If privileges uh, derive from nationality rather than from uh, citizenship, what does that mean for them? It also had a statement for Palestinian refugees living outside of historic Palestine. That is to say, you are not legitimately part of this land. Um, and then it also had a message for Palestinians uh, in the occupied territories because Israel doesn't have defined borders and it's in the process of colonizing the West Bank. So when President Obama's administration says Palestinians must recognize Israel as a Jewish state and the national home of the Jewish people, the, the national home of the Jewish people means the West Bank because there aren't any borders and it's colonizing as we speak. So. So that was an incredibly problematic position for a U.S. government to take, um, especially because there were already talks underway at the time to um, adopt uh, a constitutional-like provision, the Jewish nation state law, at the time that Obama, the Obama administration came out with this parameter. And so it knew that this was in the works, that the Israeli government was planning to have this quasi-constitutional amendment that would say that, pal that um, only Jewish people have exclusive rights to self-determination anywhere Israel extends its sovereignty. So the U.S. has not played uh, 
played as a you know fair and impartial moderator in this whole game. It's also it's been very much engaged um, in trying to support Israel and get it get it to the negotiating table, but always um, requiring concessions of Palestinians um, related to Israel's um, need to uh, identify and to also maintain a decisive Jewish majority in in the land that it wants to claim as its state. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that great historical overview. And it's uh, clear what Khaled alluded to, that going back to the status quo ante is, is not enough. And I wanted to turn to you, Khaled, because, you know, usually when we talk about this, we talk about what the United States does and what Israel does. But you had a bit of a different take in a recent essay that you wrote for the Cairo Review shortly before the election. And you wrote that, you know, given the fact that there is a radically different approach between Trump and Biden on all issues, you said that nevertheless, the realities on the ground under either a second Trump administration or a Biden administration may ultimately produce the same outcome, which is the death of a two state solution and the consolidation of a one state reality. But you also said that in the end, the future of the conflict may have less to do with who resides in the White House than with developments within the Palestinian national mm -hmm. movement. Can you elaborate on why you think that is the case? The best case scenario, if we imagine uh, coming true, the, 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 the Mahmoud Abbas fantasy coming true of moving toward immediate uh, direct negotiations between the two sides um, with the U.S. acting more or less, uh, more let's say more even-handedly than it has in the past, even in a scenario like that, um, the Palestinian side is simply not capable of making important decisions uh, like, you know, the, the kind of decisions that a two-state uh, solution would require. Um, including things like major compromises on the issue of refugees, uh, the issue of, you know, sensitive, tackling sensitive issues like the Haram Sorry, it seems like we're having some technical problems with Khaled's feed. Are you back with us? Well, let me, let me, Turn to Phyllis then, and we'll see if we can get Khaled back. Are you back, Khaled? Let me let me turn to Phyllis then. In an interview that you gave back during the summer to Counterspin, you talked about the need for a foreign policy to be based on the rejection of US exceptionalism. Uh, you said that we have to get over the idea that we're somehow better than everyone else, that we are entitled to whatever we want in the world, to destroy whatever we want in the world and to take whatever we think we need in the world. My question to you, and I undoubtedly agree with your assessment, but my question to you is, you know, in what ways both historically and, and today, do you think that this view of US exceptionalism has sort of played into and reinforced another exceptionalism and that's Israeli exceptionalism? That in its earliest history, the history of pre-state Zionism, the Zionist movement, and then the early history of Israel as a state when it was created after 1948 through the, through the Nakba, through the war of 1947-48, and really until 1967, the US had what we might consider a kind of normal relationship with Israel. It wasn't Israel's main uh, supplier of weapons. It wasn't its main strategic ally. France and Czechoslovakia actually were the two most important allies of Israel during that early period. Uh, but what we saw was that the, the emergence of this so-called special relationship had everything to do with the Six Day War in 1967, when in a very brief war, Israel was able to, as the mythology goes, it triumphed over six Arab armies. Well, there were not six Arab armies that actually fought, that was a myth, but it was, showing off clearly a very strong military capacity, which was of great interest to the Pentagon, as well as to the White House and the State Department and Congress, but particularly to the Pentagon, because when was that 1967? 
in the middle of the, of the Cold War. And it was in the middle of the US-Soviet competition for influence, for oil, for bases, for allegiances throughout the Middle East. So it emerged in that context. And Israel immediately became a kind of cat's paw of US interests, particularly in the Middle East, but far afield as well. So we know that Israeli weapons surfaced in places like Guatemala, the, that Israel trained uh, the militaries in, in uh, anti-Soviet movements across Africa. So in not only in terms of its nuclear collaboration with apartheid South Africa, but also in Mozambique, in, in uh, Angola, you had Israeli training, Israeli weapons that were surfacing in this Cold War era, as well as in Latin America, as well as, of course, in the Middle East. So in that context, Israel emerged as the most reliable military and strategic ally of the U.S. in these wars it was waging all around the world. And I think that, you know, given what we know now about Biden's support for Israel over the years, uh, I don't think that strategic connection is likely to fade anytime soon. What has changed, though, and I think it is important to keep the context of today, what has changed so dramatically is not Joe Biden's opinions or Kamala Harris's opinions or anybody else's individual opinions, but the reality of political circumstances that have changed dramatically. We have a progressive wing of the Democratic Party that for the first time has enormous power and influence. It's not yet the dominant wing, but it has emerged as a sector of the party that has to be taken seriously, has to be dealt with, because they're the ones that produce the voters on the ground. They're the ones that produce the energy. You know, the energy of this last election, in my view, looking at it, was very much uh, on the Democratic side, was far more against Trump than it was for Biden. Biden didn't excite voters. Opposing Trump, getting rid of the horror show that had characterized the, uh, the, the Trump years for so, for so many constituencies, whether it was the Muslim ban, whether it was children being caged at the border, all of these things mobilized voters far more passionately than support for Joe Biden did. But what we have now is not only that progressive wing, we have supporters of Palestinian rights in Congress. Certainly we've had Benny McCollum for, for many years now. We've had the, the squad as it's known for one term. Now we're gonna have a, a bigger squad, maybe, I don't know, there will be six or eight people who are identifying as supporting Palestinian rights as well as supporting other uh, components of, of the progressive agenda uh, that the, the progressive caucus of Congress is talking about and more. But we're also looking at an objective shift in the discourse of the country at large. And this is something that's been going on at least for the last 20 years, probably longer. So that while the pro-Israel movements and pro-Israel policies in Congress, in the White House, from administration to administration, have all continued, What's also continued in parallel to that has been a movement for Palestinian rights, challenging the $3.8 billion a year in military aid that the US gives to Israel. The fact that the question of Israel and Palestine is now a thoroughly partisan question is a new reality. That was never true before. It was always something that both parties fought to, to equally support Israel. And now what we see, if you look at the, the most recent polls, 61% of Republicans, but only 26% of Democrats say that they favor the Israeli government. That's a huge shift. And it means that anyone coming in as a leader of the Democratic Party, whatever his or her own views, they're gonna have to take that into account if they want the support of their, fo of their, of their followers. Now, what's complicated about that is that the, the biggest gap between the progressive wing and the centrist wing of the party, I would say is in the question of foreign policy. Biden has been pushed significantly to the left in a number of arenas, in climate, in healthcare, probably in labor, and maybe even immigration. He has not been pushed to the left in foreign policy. And add to that the fact that Biden views his own experience as making him the main expert on foreign policy, on foreign affairs. He was the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. He's had the experience of being vice president in the Obama years. So in his view, he doesn't need to rely on anybody else on foreign policy. 
And that's the arena where he is the farthest from the left wing of his own party. So he has chosen advisors, the ones we know about so far, who are comfortable for him, people he's known forever, worked with before. And these are people who are professionals, they are experts, they are brilliant in most cases, which is very different than what we had been seeing for the last four years. But they are people who have spent the last decades, two or three or four decades, not only inside the beltway, but inside the box. And what we need now desperately are people who are going to think outside the box with new ideas, a whole new approach to foreign policy, including the question of Palestine. Yeah, that's a perfect segue into my question that I want to open to the whole panel. Let's drill down a bit into what we can expect out of the Biden administration. And let's start with the fact that this is a politician who's been in the public eye for nearly a half century, uh, a half century. And his public positions on Israel and the Palestinian people are very well known. We've probably all seen floating around the internet recently, some of the videos where Joe Biden is advocating passionately and adamantly for the US to move the embassy to Jerusalem, where he talks in an interview about being a Zionist and needing to invent Israel if it didn't exist. You know, I remember when uh, President Obama was on the campaign trail and even after he became president, and certainly this happened with Hillary Clinton too, when she ran, there was this sense among pro-Israel advocates that Obama and Clinton were just kind of going through the motions, but they didn't really feel the love for Israel. I think it's pretty clear that Biden really has that clear emotional uh, connection uh, to the issue. So I want to ask about two things because I don't want to be too pessimistic. I want to be hopeful, but I want to be realistic. So, you know, given who he set out at his foreign policy advisors, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, given his record, given what Phyllis just laid out, what gives you, if anything, what gives you hope for a change in his foreign policy direction as president, given that he hasn't moved on it so far? I throw that open to anyone. I'll jump in with one quick thing about it. And it, it links to something I said earlier, which is I think that his foreign policy is not gonna be only his own. And what gives me hope is precisely the kinds of changes that we've seen inside Congress, in our movements, in who's in the Democratic Party. We, we're gonna need a Congress that takes bold steps and that's gonna be a little complicated. It's not about you know having our champions get up and make great speeches, it's about how to help them build the kinds of coalitions that will be needed to actually pass legislation that's going to change US policy in the region as a whole, towards Israel directly, and towards Palestinian rights. Progressives now have a new level of, in, of influence within the Democratic Party, and, Oba and, and Biden is gonna have to take that seriously. But he's not going to simply give up the passion that I absolutely agree with you, Josh, is very much part of his, his own being, as well as it's part of his traditional political views. So I think our challenge as a social movement is to, to focus on making clear that the change, the massive change in popular discourse, the significant change in the media discourse, and now the beginnings of change at the policy discourse level are, are not anything that are going away. And that the new administration and the new Congress is going to have to deal with it in a way that they've never had to deal with it before. I'll just jump in after this list, um, because I think what I wanted to say is um, follows nicely <laughs> with what she said. And I would just point out that, you know, Biden has really centered human rights and racial justice and a values-based uh, foreign policy in his approach. And I think that that is something that presents an opportunity for us. And that's not because past democratic administrations haven't also talked about human rights. It's because of the moment that we're in right now. That mo This moment of racial reckoning, along with the fact that Biden has so centered human rights, racial justice, democracy in his, in his platform and in his approach, 
will give um, progressives an opportunity to call out hypocrisy and to point out points in which um, you know the Biden administration is is straying from that approach. And there are there are new fresh faces coming into the administration in the um, because of the the um, push for more inclusivity and diversity. So there are going to be different perspectives coming in, people that are Palestinian, people that are Arab, people that are Muslim. And there are folks that are former officials that are not of the restorationist mold, they're more of the reformer mold. And though they don't have their vote, they're not gonna have their voice uh, early on in the administration, you know, events will overtake um, an administration and, and they will have an opportunity to engage on Palestine in a different way. And, um, and but that's going to depend on a progressive movement that keeps demanding, keeps demanding that. Um, and I also just wanted to note that this election was really um, different in a lot of ways in terms of like just the amount of effort uh, within ethnic communities and in particular the Arab American, Palestinian American community towards getting out the vote. And the Biden campaign was very sensitive to this. And that's why they regularly met with um, the Arab American and Palestinian American community over the course of um, you know, the election, um, recognizing their political power in key swing states. And um, this was something we hadn't seen before. You know, the current um, you know, uh, pick for Secretary of State had met with Palestinians repeatedly, had met with Arab American community to talk about their concerns. So it's not, it's gonna be an administration that that already has contacts to the uh, constituencies and communities that care about um, the issue of Palestinian human rights. And they're gonna recognize that in 2024, they're gonna need those communities to come out and get out the vote again. So they're gonna be listening uh, with much more interest to uh, those concerns about Palestinian uh, human rights and about the Palestine-Israel um, file more, more so than past administrations, I would argue. So those are opportunities for um, really engaging if you know you, we maintain the energy and civil society maintains its activism around Palestine and engages with the administration, engages with members of Congress. There are opportunities there in my view. Uh, I, if I could go ahead and uh, and jump in also. First, I, I want to apologize. I was having some technical difficulties, so I, I don't know uh, how much of what I was saying earlier was, um, was actually um, um, you know, uh, broadcast or or at what point I got cut off. But uh, just picking up this thread here, um, I agree uh, with both Phyllis and Zaha that, you, you know, Biden is kind of a known quantity in terms of where he stands, uh, as, as you pointed out, Josh. But I think there are some interesting opportunities. Obviously, the moment that we're in, the politics, uh, the domestic politics that Zaha referred to, uh, the new standing that Arab Americans and Palestinian Americans have uh, as a result of this kind of changing politics uh, at the domestic level. Um, but I want to throw in something that might be a little bit, you know, sort of counterintuitive. Um, I think it's pretty clear that Biden, unlike Obama, is a true believer, right? Obama was not terribly sentimental uh, about Israel. Um, and yet even he was not able to do very much uh, because he was constrained by a very right wing Congress. Uh, but also he was constrained, I think, by the perception that he was not sympathetic uh, to Israel. Um, Biden has a very different uh, reputation. Uh, I think it'll be very, very hard for even the hardcore Israeli right to dismiss him as anti-Israel, much less uh, anti-Semitic, uh, as uh, at least some on the right in Israel uh, uh, intimated towards Obama. Um, and so in that sense, I think Biden might be more like uh, uh, Bill Clinton than he is uh, a Barack Obama in the sense that uh, Clinton was also very passionate about Israel. He was a, also, I think, a true believer 
who spoke about Israel in very kind of flowing, sentimental terms. Uh, but that gave him, I think, the, um, the credibility, at least with the Israeli side, to do certain things that he might not otherwise uh, have been willing to do. Um, it's interesting, uh, you know, I have a quote in my book from uh, Bill Quant, who really is probably the foremost expert on Arab-Israeli negotiations and, and the history of that entire process. And um, he, I quote him as saying uh, that if ever there was a, a uh, an American president who could be called both pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian at the same time, it was Bill Clinton. Um, it seems counterintuitive because of his very strong pro-Israel credentials, uh, Bill Clinton's, uh, but at the same time that gave him the space to be able to explore what was then a very new relationship with the Palestinian leadership. Um, you know, Bill Clinton was the guy who brought Yasser Arafat out from the cold. Um, he was the one who stood up to people like Dennis Ross in the administration who said, no, don't invite him to the signing ceremony. He's still an arch terrorist. Um, and he said, no, if this agreement is going to stick, uh, if the Oslo agreement is going to stick, you have to have uh, the leaders of both sides. Um, and he did things like, uh, you know, that historic visit to Bethlehem in Gaza uh, he pushed the envelope in a lot of ways, meeting with the families of Palestinian prisoners, uh, which was very controversial at the time uh, in the 1990s. So you had a very pro-Israel president who was willing to push the envelope when it came to uh, to the Palestinians because partly the, the geopolitical realities had changed, but also because American domestic politics have changed. And I think there is at least the potential that Biden could play a similar role if he's being pushed in that direction. Uh, and, and so in that sense, it, it, you know, we still have to wait and see who else will end up working on this issue inside the Biden administration. Uh, but it, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that you could see those kinds of gestures coming from, uh, from a, a President Biden. If I could just add one point to that, I think that's very important, Khaled. And I, I wanted to go back to also something that Zaha said a few minutes ago about uh, this notion of who's who's pushing, you know, the, the presence of Palestinian and Arab voices being talked to within the administration, within Congress. Uh, one of our, our uh, participants sent in a question or a comment saying, don't forget about the black and brown members of Congress who are supporting Palestinian rights. And that's very important. I mean, we know there's only one active Palestinian uh, so far in Congress who's, who's out there, uh, Rashid Tlaib, of course, who is our, our great champion in supporting Palestinian rights. The others who are supporting Palestinian rights are not themselves Palestinian or Arab, so except for, for Ilhan Omar. So I think that we do need to look at the, the black and brown members of Congress but as important is the outside forces, the fact that our movement right now, the racial reckoning that Zaha was speaking of earlier, that is so much shaping what our country is about right now, so much shaping how we respond to the pandemic, the fact that it's black and brown and indigenous communities that are the hardest hit by the pandemic is has as much to do with the mobilizations of Black Lives Matter as the killings by police. All of that has come together and the fact that those movements that are defining themselves as being against white supremacy for black liberation are including, as Nelson Mandela famously did in the late 1990s, the understanding that our liberation cannot be complete as long as the Palestinians are not free. The fact that all of those, mov those movements have normalized, if I can use the word, the issue of Palestine within the broader progressive movement. So that there is no, the idea of being PEP, progressive except Palestine, has become much more difficult now. It's much harder to do that. It's much more a central feature of all of our progressive movements. So I think that part is going to have as much impact on the Biden administration and the incoming Congress as the internal part as well. This is going to be an inside-outside strategy. help us all to remember 
the mistakes that were made under the Obama administration in terms of a lot of the demobilization that that happens. Uh, one of the things that gives me hope, stepping out of my moderator role for just a second, is the fact that we've actually seen Biden change on issues over the course of the primary and general election, especially after the more progressive wing of the party and their candidates dropped out of the election. Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, he started adopting some of their policy proposals and some of their rhetoric even. So that's something that gives me hope is that he is somewhat malleable on, on his positions. But what I wanna do right now, we're, we're running a little low on time. I wanna drill down a little bit into some of the specifics of the legislative constraints that exist on the incoming Biden administration, because as Khaled alluded to, it's not just that the Trump administration has created so much uh, destructiveness toward the Palestinian people with its policies, but Congress has also really, really piled on over the last four years. And I think you could even make the case that the congressional policy toward the Palestinian people has in many respects even reverted to its pre-Oslo days. So uh, Khaled or Zaha, could either or both of you talk about the Taylor Force Act, talk about the Anti-Terrorism Clarification Act, these major pieces of legislation that were passed by Congress with bipartisan support that kind of constrain what Biden is able to do. Do you want me to go ahead? Sure. <laughs> okay, so just in case um, folks watching this don't know, so the Taylor Force Act basically said that um, aid to Palestinians, with very few exceptions, was going to be cut so long as Palestinians continue to provide um, social welfare payments to prisoners and the families of those who had been killed in political vi violence against Israel. So aid has been cut um, because Palestinians continue to pay um, social welfare, make uh, social welfare payments to prisoners and to their families of, of those who'd been killed. And um, the other piece of legislation that I want to note that uh, that uh, Josh brought up was the Anti-Terrorism Clarification Act and, and its amendment. So today, the Anti-Terrorism Clarification Act basically says that Palestinians are going, the PLO and the PA are going to be held liable uh, and their jurisdiction will be triggered for um, previously dismissed terrorism cases if um, the PLO and the PA continue to provide social welfare payments to prisoners and to the families of those um, who have been killed in political violence. Um, and it also says that the PLO, if it establishes uh, an office or um, has official presence, so one of their representatives travels on official business to the US, that would also trigger um, the uh, jurisdiction. Now the PLO and PA, um, had been um, uh, liable for around $650 million worth of damages from uh, political violence cases that were from the second Intifada days. And those were dismissed uh, by the Court of Appeals. And so um, those would become reactivated basically and those damage claims would become due and uh, potentially bankrupting um, the PA and PLO. So those are two pieces of legislation that incoming Biden administration has to deal with when it says it wants to reestablish a PLO office or it wants to um, restart aid to Palestinians. The, the thing is about um, these dismissed cases that I mentioned is that, um, that the deadline for the PA, PLO to stop making those payments um, or risk having triggered jurisdiction was in April 2020. So it's already been triggered and the PA PLO is already, um, I'm sure the, the um, uh, cases are gonna be uh, restarted if they haven't already been restarted in, in, um, in court to, to execute on those damage claims. So then the question is, what is the Biden administration gonna do? It wants to give aid to Palestinians and restart aid, but you know, we, the Palestinian Authority the PLO is facing $650 million worth of damages even if it's able to restart aid um, because the PA or PLO um, revises its laws that provide 
uh, benefits and um, social welfare payments, even if it revises that law, it, the, the, the cat's already out of the bag <laughs> and the uh, um, jurisdiction's been triggered. So what, what can a Biden administration do? Is it going to go tell the families that ha are, are refiling those cases that, sorry, you're not going to get um, your, your, um, you know, your damage claims uh, executed upon? I mean, there's really a lot of problems with the idea that the Biden administration is actually going to restart aid and, or actually do something that's going to repair the bilateral relationship with Palestinians because of just the, the nature of this web of legislative restrictions on the PLO and the PA and um, all of these um, laws that I've mentioned the Taylor Force Act and the uh, Anti-Terrorism Clarification Act. There's also limitations on what the U.S. can do in terms of reopening a consulate in um, Jerusalem. You know, there are restrictions around uh, being able to open up a new office um, for, um, you know, to have basically a consulate that, that could serve Palestinians and not be um, under the U.S. embassy. So these are some of the challenges. I, I see we're going, getting low on time and I don't want to take up any more. I'd like to hear also from Khaled. Uh, yeah, just, just real quick. Obviously, um, uh, Zaha did an excellent job of sort of laying out the, the legal and legislative restrictions. Um, but I, I do think that, and, that the executive does have some authority here, but it's a. It's really. It, it comes down to a matter of political will. Uh, we've seen uh, from the current administration a very liberal use of executive orders, for example, um, in ways that are outrageous, in ways that clearly violate not only the Constitution but basic First Amendment rights. Um, so we would need to see a very activist, proactive. Maybe activist isn't the right word, but a proactive role by the Biden administration. Um, Laura Friedman has a great piece out um, where she argues that the Biden administration can simply declare uh, Congress's meddling in these areas to be unconstitutional, that this essentially usurps the role of the executive in the constitutional role of the executive, which has the prerogative in formulating foreign policy. And so uh, there are legal tools that that the administration could use if it had the political will. Um, and again, it all comes down to the question of who's pushing and how hard uh, and, in, and in what direction. But, but I think these things are, uh, are within the realm of possibility, but so much of it will also depend on the Palestinian leadership. How much are they willing to push in terms of reinventing the bilateral relationship, or I should say inventing the bilateral relationship because it hasn't really ever existed. It's always been a function of uh, the U.S.-Israel relationship or the peace process. So uh, the Palestinian leadership will have to assert itself, I think, in ways that it is unaccustomed to doing as well. Really important. Uh, thank you both for the really important uh, clarifications on those important pieces of legislation. Before we wrap up, I do want to turn to the issue of Congress uh, for, for a few minutes. And Phyllis made mention of the fact that the progressive squad is growing as a result of the 2020 elections. And I want to name check a couple of candidates who were very upfront and out front about their support for Palestinian rights in the primaries. We saw Cori Bush in Missouri, Jamal Bowman in New York, Marie Newman in Illinois, all take positions that were very, very supportive of Palestinian rights and actually make that a part of their campaign to successfully get elected against uh, entrenched established Democrats. So my question for each of you, if you can ref reflect briefly on this question is, you know, we, we had many different tactics they were put forward by the progressive members of Congress in this Congress. We saw the legislation that Representative McCollum introduced, which she mentioned at the top of our uh, panel tonight. You know, we saw lots of dear colleague letters that were sent to the State Department. What do you think are the specific issues and the specific strategies that these progressive members of Congress should uh, 
try to pursue and follow up on in order for there to be hopefully a more bolder approach in Congress that pushes the Biden administration in the right direction. Go for it, Phyllis. Uh, okay. Okay, well, I think there's a couple of factors that we have to keep in mind. One is that we're, we're electing people for the first time, as you say, Josh, it's hugely important that we're actually electing people partly, and it's a small part, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a part of their political credential is that they support Palestinian rights. That's a reflection of this broader shift in political and public and media discourse. It doesn't change the fact that most people in Washington, in Congress, congressional staff, people in the administration, certainly the high ranking people in, the, in any administration, live in a bubble. They live in a bubble of narrowed information. You know, they're not sitting there, other than the current occupant of the White House, perhaps. They're not sitting there watching the news on TV all day long. They're, they're seeing what their assistants, what their aides give them to see. And that sometimes leaves out important things like these new polls, one of them I, that I indicated earlier, that show what a partisan issue this now is, that democratic, the democratic base has moved dramatically on the question of Palestinian rights. So I think one of the things we have to do as activists outside is to provide a constant flow of information gently, not overwhelming people because they'll turn away from it, but making sure that their staff and members of Congress have not just information about what's going on on the ground inside Palestine, but what's going on in the ground in this country about Palestine. So for all these members of Congress who haven't said a word about Palestine, but have said some very important supportive things about the movement for black lives, about the poor people's campaign, about the movements that are functioning right now in this crisis moment, they need to be reminded that all of those organizations take up the question of Palestinian rights as a given, that it's part of what they stand for. So that's important. And I think part of it is a bit counterintuitive as well, that when we talk about how do we get bolder, I think that doesn't necessarily mean pushing each individual member of Congress to be the most bold in her or his speeches and to, to be the, you know, the, the, the activist that they, these are people who come out of our movements. They have years of experience leading rallies, leading marches, leading sit-ins. They're now going to have to do a different job. And it's not just about giving great speeches. It's going to be about how can they build coalitions with other members of Congress who haven't quite made those moves yet, who don't quite get that these shifts are underway. So at times, I think our boldest move is going to be to kind of urge a holding back of some of the some of the language, some of the approaches of some of our own champions in Congress to figure out ways that they can work at the at their strongest by working the most collaboratively with the largest coalitions that they can put together. That's going to be our bold work ahead. Mm. I jump in or are we out of time? Please go ahead. <laughs> okay. I, I agree with everything Phyllis said, and I usually do agree with everything Phyllis. <laughs> so um, I would just I would just flag something because I agree with Phyllis. You know, it's not about what what can members of Congress do for this issue. It's what can civil society do to support members of Congress to to take the positions we want them to take. And I, I just want to flag the biggest challenge we face, which is on the issue of anti-Semitism and equating, you know, advocacy and, uh, you know, uh, you know, for a rights-based approach towards the Palestine-Israel conflict and, and, you know, even just expression of a Palestinian identity or narrative as being anti-Semitism. This is the biggest challenge. And this is what's going to dog other members of Congress from taking action because they do not want to be slapped with that label. And I think it's incumbent upon civil society to really take an offensive approach here and to um, establish that, you know, Palestinian identity, Palestinian advocacy, human rights, 
that is not anti-Semitism. And to define exactly what anti-Semitism is so that we can empower public officials, members of Congress, all the way down the line, from the federal level all the way down to the local level, that you know they can they can respect Palestinian human rights and and they can support uh, you know the rights of Jews to be free from hate um, like any other people in this country without running afoul of um, a label such as anti-Semitism. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure that there's that much more for me to add. I mean, other than, um, you know, the the it's really, really important. And we have a, 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 a huge opportunity right now to change the conversation. Um, I, and I think more than it's I think it's more important than lobbying for or against any particular piece of legislation. Um, but but having a conversation, calling out members uh, when they say things uh, that dehumanize Palestinians, so much of the discourse um, that has been internalized and has become so reflexive for members of Congress is rooted in this kind of dehumanization of Palestinians. And so you get progressives, people who describe themselves of, as progressives, saying crazy th things like, you know, Palestinian leaders uh, send their children uh, to die on TV cameras or use their children as human shields. Uh, really, really outrageous stuff. So I, I think, you know, I think the more uh, we can push on uh, sort of rehumanizing Palestinians uh, and changing the discourse um, and, and calling out members when, when they do, I think those are, those are relatively low hanging fruit uh, that, that can have, I think, long term payoff in terms of how they view uh, the conflict without having to tackle difficult issues, or I should say before even having to tackle, you know, the, the, the heavy lifts of, is it anti-Semitism? Is it anti-Israel? Um, if it's just plain humanizing Palestinians, I think those are always kind of a win-win. If I could add just one on, on this which I agree with that it is going to be a huge one. It already is. And Khaled's point is absolutely right, that humanization of Palestinians is crucial to this. And I just want to flag that for going forward, the role of AMP and Jewish Voice for Peace, both of whom define Palestinian rights as their raison d'etre, is going to be an increasing important, uh, important component of how we go forward. And I'm looking forward to working jointly with between JVP and AMP as we go forward. Well, I wanna take this opportunity to really thank all of our distinguished panelists for taking the time to share with us their wisdom and their insights tonight. It's really fascinating conversation. I wish we had more time to go into even more uh, detail, but I do wanna encourage everyone to join us again uh, eight o'clock Eastern for an exciting panel that we have on youth activism. And please also be sure to check out our star studded virtual gala tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern. Get all of the details for the rest of our conference at palestineconvention.org. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>